basal going on over that end. Uh, this kind of thing happened during the next of this very nice conference and opportunity of telling you about our work. I will tell you in a minute what cause of the dynamical transportation is. As we said, this is the quantum gravity model, which is defined in the past integral. But as a start, uh, as a motivation for this model, as we all know, uh, gravity, Einstein's gravity as a quantum mechanics theory, is perturbative in non renormalized atoms in four dimensions. However, as was forward by Stephen Michael some 40 years ago, there is still a chance that gravity can be formulated as a predictive theory, as a predictive, predictive part of the theory, uh, in a non perturbative regime. And this is called uh, the asymptotic safety idea. So, just to give you the impression how it uh, could work. So, suppose we have some theory of gravity with many cutting constants, and we consider a flow uh, to higher and higher energies. So, you should have to adjust these cutting constants to, uh, to the time for this renormalization to flow. And if it happens that there exists a ultra diverse fixed point in, in the theory, and if the subspace of important cuttings in the vicinity of this fixed point is finite. It is possible that uh, the theory can still be predicted. However, the values of these couplings are not necessarily small. So this is why the, uh, the uh, perturbative expansion doesn't work. However, it still can be investigated using some uh, perturbative uh, techniques. So, uh, of course, it is not easy to, uh, to uh, study such a theory. However, we can try to use lattice methods, lattice formulations, more or less as people do in quantum chrome dynamics in the regime of energies for uh, but if expansion fails. But to do this, what we would need, uh, we would need a dynamical lattice which will encode geometry, which is dynamical itself. Uh, we would like to have a second or higher order phase transition, which should be related to these two UV fixed points. And we would like also to be able to reproduce any classical limit, which should be uh, classical GR. And it turns out that to have all these three ingredients, uh, we need additionally a causality, uh, causality requirement, which I'll define just in a minute. And it leads up to the leads us to the model of causal dynamical triangulations. Okay, so uh, because of one line that is a quantum gravity model which is based on that path integral approach, just to, to, to take a look very quickly. Uh, as you know, in classical mechanics, we just have, have a single trajectory for particle, and quantum mechanics can be formulated using the path integral approach, in which you have sum over all possible trajectories with a, a wave of e to i times classical action. And uh, to define this uh, this this uh, path integral, what is done in practice, time is uh, uh, divided into uh, into uh, some discrete units, and uh, if this uh, delta t goes to zero, you recover continuous uh, theory. And we of course know that Einstein's gravity is about the space and geometry. And we can also try to discretize this geometry by using triangulation. So any difficult uh, surface or, or the manifold can be discretized this way. And uh, in this approach, curvature is not included with the physical angle. Here we have the example two dimensions, but all of these can be extended to more dimensions equal to four, which leads us to our approach. So in our approach, the space-time uh, trajectory is just the space-time geometry, which is a regularized by triangulation. And we built such a triangulation using two types of the building blocks, like children do from, you know, from Lego blocks, which is built together. And uh, we assume that the curvature uh, inside, uh, that the space-time is flat inside such a block, and the whole curvature is encoded in the way they are built together. And this is a uh, Fully non perturbative approach as we sum over all such possible trajectories. And what is important in our approach, we additionally assume causality, which is related to global hyperbolicity. So, for a globally hyperbolic spacetime, uh, 
topology can be such that space time can be divided into time and space. And we just also topologically divide our calculation into time and space, so we introduce some global proper time. We have foliation clips of this uh, uh, structure, which are special hypersurfaces. And we assume that they have fixed topology, which cannot change, we cannot uh, evolve during, uh, during uh, can change during evolution. So typically, we impose time variable time variable conditions, which is as one. And we have the topology of space, which is S3. Recently, we also investigate other topologies, but this is uh, inside of this work. Okay, so let me here consider the pure gravity model. So we just have gravitational degrees of freedom, even put and matter inside. And uh, it turns out that uh, the Einstein Hilbert action calibrated for this triangulation takes a very simple form. This form is some simple because we just have two building blocks which uh, define of the, which, 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 from which our calculation is constructed. So uh, we just have, uh, the action is just uh, a linear combination of some very global numbers in the triangulation and the total number of vertices, the total number of force synthesis, and the total number of this force synthesis of that form of the building blocks. And this is weighted by Three company constants, which is k0, k4, and delta. Basically, k0 is rated to 1 over g, k4 is rated to cosmological constant, and delta is rated to the asymmetric parameter which we introduced. So, in principle, the length of timeline and space like links nothing has to be the same, and it promotes this asymmetry to the company constant. And then, what we do, we make a big rotation, which is I could well define it set up as we know this time of this space, and from the uh, from this type of the uh, uh, path integral, we just get the partition function with minus q, which is that the system of random geometry which can be investigated using numerical methods, Monte Carlo methods. I will not go into details of this uh, this numerical simulation, but just show you the results. Uh, the important thing here is that entropy, this is the number of configuration which comes into the sum, is equally important in this direction. So just the, the solution uh, comes as the interplay between entropy and direction. Okay, so right now about the phase structure, as it was uh, observed some time ago. Okay, uh, so just to uh, measure anything, we should decide, uh, we should define some observable. And let me focus here on some very simple observable, which is just the volume of these spatial slices. So it is related to the number of tetrahedra, which deal with such uh, spatial slices. We can count them in numerical situation, simulations, and we just know what's the lattice volume of the given proper time. And if you look at this uh, volume profile, we can uh, distinguish three different phases. Here you see our phase diagram. Here is k naught coupling constant, here is delta, and we also have this fourth coupling constant, which is in our simulations fine tuned to the critical value. And this critical value, our theory becomes the equivalent, and this is so to take the infinite volume limit. So we have to find this fourth coupling constant, so we are effectively left with just two coupling constants. So depending on the value of the coupling constants in the simulations, you can distinguish these three phases. And the typical volume, special volume profile as a function of time in this phase A is shown here. So this is just the sequence of uh, uncorrelated maxima and minima. Whereas in phase B, all special volume just sits in one time slot. This is collapsed. And the most interesting situation happens in phase C, where you have some region of proper time where you see some extended universe. And it turns out that this, what we call phase C, so this space, uh, this, this region here on the, on, the, on the phase diagram, has very interesting physical properties. First of all, we uh, proved that uh, the effective dimension is equal to the topological dimension. I mean, this system is somehow resenting the fractal, so it doesn't have to be that uh, effective dimension is the same topological dimension. In fact, in this other phase, A and B is not so. But it turns out that in this phase C it is, and both so called half of dimension, spectrum dimension are four. Uh, okay, what is more? When we, uh, of course, what, what's interesting are just uh, the expectation values of correlation, functions of observables, not, 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 
of single triangulation. We just can calculate expectation values of correlation or, or correlations. So if you, for example, look at the uh, average volume profile measured in space C, it is very well fitted for such a function, which is consistent with, Euclidean, with, with the volume profile of the Euclidean uh, universe. Just to remind you, we made this big rotation, so we are here with Euclidean tolerance and regime. So, uh, this kind of solution is obtained uh, for such a metric, uh, which, uh, in case of GR, uh, uh, when put into the Einstein filter action, has this form. And this is just the mini super space action we just already mentioned uh, in last time. Okay, so what we proved is that the effective action which, which describes the behavior of this special volume observable is consistent really with the discretization of this mini super space action. So to do this, we can look at uh, correlation of volume fluctuations between different spatial sizes and the correlation matrix is related to the derivatives of this effective action. And it can be measured and proved that this, what we measure, is really consistent with such a form of the effective action, which is just the discretization of the PO to see just this line uh, derivative is replaced by the final difference and the rest is effective same. So, uh, yeah, this is the outcome in phase C. And right now about phase transition. So, uh, generally, to analyze uh, the phase transition, we to find an order point, which is basically a quantity which is zero or constant in one phase and non zero or, or changing in another phase. So, in case of our simulations, we consider different quantities. Uh, usually, these were very human numbers as the number of or synthesis of the number of vertices in triangulation. And it turns out that uh, a good uh, order parameters which we can measure are just those global numbers which just come together with a very coupling constant. So, for example, if you want to investigate the CA phase transition, you are just varying K0 or constant delta, so you are just looking, you are varying K0, so you are just looking at distance zero. In the case of this PC phase transition, you are also looking at these parameters. And the critical point is signaled by maximum in uh, susceptibility of order parameters, so we can just find where the phase transition takes place. And where we are sitting exactly at this phase transition point, it turns out that this order parameter in bo both in this transition and this transition jump into metastatic state. Which on the first side could suggest that both transitions are first order. I just remind you about the first transition of higher order one phase. But it turns out that when we consider bigger and bigger lattice problems, this as C phase transition space first order, but this DC phase transitions uh, is turning more and more uh, second or higher order. So we can also uh, compute some uh, some uh, uh, some exponents, uh, and uh, it turns out that these exponents which are measured here are consistent with higher order of the transition. So the lesson from it is that we have already this second order transition. Are interested in. Okay, uh, but this is not the end of the story about phase structure. And we discovered that this phase machine is in fact a little bit more complicated than I just showed you. And uh, to, to, to show you this, uh, I just will comment a little bit on the method we, we used to, to discover that. Okay, so this is the so called trans uh, effective transfer model. So, by definition, CDT can be formulated as uh, by, by using the transfer map. So we just have the, our space time is divided into hyper surfaces of constant time. So we can just define the transition amplitude from time t to time t plus one, which is uh, parameterized by all degrees of freedom, which, which are there for calculations. And this defines the transfer matrix. And just the addition function for our theory can be just computed as trace of this. Transfer matrix to power t, where t is the time period. However, uh, what we measured inside this phase C is that also the effective action, action which describes the special volume observable has this simple form which just couples the neighboring 
uh, spy, uh, special slices. And if so, maybe we can define the effective like, uh, transfer matrix which will just disturb this special one observable. And if it is possible, just we can uh, measure the effective action on Lagrangian uh, directly because this transfer matrix is just proportional to E times minus Lagrangian. And just not to go into the details, I can tell you that this transfer matrix can be measured in numerical simulations. And uh, this what we measure in this region of XC, where we are really living with XC, is very really consistent with this mini superspace action. And the superspace diagram is exactly what was before. Uh, specifically, we can look at this kinet. Uh, if you this is this measure of constant matrix, right? uh, we can look at the kinet term by considering such curves for fixed n plus n, so for fixed n plus n, this is just the uh, normalization, and we, you, you have the constant matrix is e to minus l, so we just get the Gaussian behavior of this kinet, let's say, coefficients. Uh, and so we can also measure potential by looking at the diagonal, and it's consistent with this uh, volume from after minus small to And but uh, and we also check that when we consider this effective model, which just describes uh, special economic fluctuations, this uh, measure transfer matrix gives exactly the same results as the field as, as the full field, which is somehow confirmed that this approach is, is working. However, when we are close to this BC based transition, so somewhere here on the phase diagram, it turns out that for small lattice volume, if you measure this constant lattice, we recover this Gaussian kinetic term. However, if you go to higher lattice volumes, this single Gaussian splits into two shift recursions, and it signals that something else is going on here. So, and this is, this is just, how, just how this shift looks so for small lattice volumes. It is zero, and then it rises more or less uh, linearly to increase the lattice volume. This part of the okay, so it led us to the idea that there exists a computing new size, which was not previously discovered. And this new size should be related to this bifurcation of the effective actions of this double Gaussian structure. And uh, when we just make uh, the measurement of our average volume profiles inside this region, we see that compared to this phase C, this phase C, this is this red curve here, but compared to this phase C, our volume prof profile is shrinking in time direction, more and more shrinking. It, it's, it still has this more or less block structure, but it is much thinner than before in time direction. And we can explain this shrinking this, 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 this time timing in time direction exactly by this form of the effective transfer matrix. So when we uh, make an effective model with such a such a transfer matrix, such an action, it exactly replicates the data we measure in full CDT. But what's more interesting are the geometric properties of this newly discovered replication phase. So first of all, we measure what the, what is the effective dimension here. And just to remind you, in phase C, the effective dimension is equal to topological dimension, so it is equal to 4. However, it turns out that in this bifurcation phase, it is not, not longer 4. For example, we can define the half of the dimension. The half of the dimension is defined uh, by uh, restating average volume profiles measured for different sizes of the system. And if you do, if you, if you, uh, if you assume that uh, you have a given value of half of the dimension, they should they should all uh, be given by a uh, single cut. And as you see here, for the H equal 4 in this case, it works because it gives a single curve. However, in this new phase, the compared it doesn't help much. However, if you assume the dimension is infinite, it much is perfect. The same can be done for so called spectral dimension. The spectral dimension is related to the random walk, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, performed by a set of particle in this uh, triangulation. And you can calculate the probability of return to the origin, and this probability of return is related to the so called spectrum dimension, which uh, depends on diffusion time. So uh, it is important uh, that we are just interested in the behavior for large diffusion times. So for large diffusion times, and as you see here in this green graph, this is for phase C, this is consistent with 4. However, if we are in this bifurcation region, it was much of a 4. 
And such a uh, spectral dimension, uh, as my uh, uh, suggests that there is high connectivity between building blocks or between our four synthesis. And in fact, we measured uh, it directly in our work estimation, and we found that in the case of the spectrification device, four volume is concentrated in clusters. So such clusters of four synthesis within very short periods of distance come from another form, and they are linked by singular vertices, I mean vertices of very high order, uh, typically 10 or 100 times higher than the other vertex that tells them. So we have this structure which uh, somehow uh, propagates in time. You can also look at individual spatial slices or spatial geometries. And from this picture, you, should, you, you see that the spatial geometries probably should differ between these, let's say, orthogonal spatial slices. And indeed, it is so. For example, you can calculate the average temperature scalar, and whereas in very C, it is constant, so it is uh, more or less the same in each time slice. Uh, in the bifurcation phase, it jumps between the two values. One is for all, one is for different values. Also, we can look, look, for example, at the ex uh, average extent of the universe. So this is mainly uh, this is defined as the I mean, uh, we take the number of uh, just the volume in distance out from some starting point and some origin, and you just have like, this, this 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 average of R. And you see that uh, for in this uh, phase, in this C phase, it is consistent with, uh, if you calculate it from different volume, uh, this is just data from multiple simulations, if you calculate it for various volumes, here is log volume, here is log out, it is consistent with this relation. So this is just uh, special geometry, it's three dimensional. The other thing is bifurcation phase, you have the speed into this two families of special slices, both important and one, and it looks like this. So let us now look at the vicinity of these very singular vertices here. So if we are in the spatial size and we look at this vicinity, what is observed, and each such vertex is shared by really a huge number of spatial tetrahedra. So a really macroscopic uh, volume is sitting around in short geodesic distance and it forms a kind of cluster. What's more, the boundary, so the, I mean, it's the picture in one dimension left, but the boundary is three dimensional, sorry, sorry two dimensional in this, this text, so this boundary has a topology of the sphere. Geometrically, it doesn't have to be a sphere, but topologically, it is a sphere. And this kind of structure evolves in time. So, this is just a big question mark, uh, and just a speculation, but maybe what we do, we maybe observe a quantum black hole between these lines. Okay, so just to finish, because my time is, uh, is finishing, uh, just uh, one more thing about the newly discovered phase transition, so between this C phase and this newly discovered bifurcation phase. So, uh, in order to analyze that, we need a proper object for me. Very transparent that the obvious parameters we were before, we used before are not uh, giving any strong signals. However, we, find, we found one which is giving a very strong signal, this new phase transition. And as you see, here is this susceptibility, so the uh, transition point is signaled by the, uh, by the maximum probability susceptibility. And we see more or less the same situation as was observed here before. So we see this jumping of this one over the parameter between two metastable states. However, as before, this, 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 these two states seem to converge as lattice volume is, is increased. So, if you, if you calculate these critical exponents, they are often consistent with a phase transition of higher order, not the first order, which is, of course, good news for, for us because potentially we will be able to define a continuous continuum in this phase transition. Uh, okay, maybe I'll skip that because my time is over, so uh, just coming to conclusion, conclusions. Uh, so, using this effective transfer method, we method, discovered a completely new phase, uh, which we call the bifurcation phase. The geometry of this new phase is very not trivial and interesting, and potentially might be observed by a uh, block order. And the uh, new phase transition seems to be the second order, and uh, I didn't mention that. Okay.
That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, so this is this, and, and then guys, I want to Okay. Uh, I have a question about <laughs> infinite dimension. Infinite okay, you can go first. I was first. Yeah, okay, you can go first. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, is, what do you mean this uh, this infinite dimension, how the dimension? How do you get it? What, that, what is the definition of it? But, but I, I, I mean, you have to study this infinite, what we just say, what, what we just see in this. I mean, we, we, we just, uh, in the last approach, you can be always finite, finite volume, okay? And you can just measure uh, some observable for different volumes and, and just extrapolate, okay? And uh, what we observe is just the effect of this extrapolation. So we, we, we would extrapolate it in, in a volume to infinity, it seems that. Something like household dimension would go to anything, but nothing more. Oh. I can just say that this household dimension is very, very high. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just came a few minutes later, so maybe you already said it. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering uh, do you have some partially ordered uh, set or set uh, structure on uh, whatever is your background? Or... Uh, I mean, you have triangulations and uh, uh, you know so on, right? Uh, you described uh, this is partially ordered this set structure anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, I, think he, I think he's asking us the right question. You have any relation between um, causal dynamical yeah. triangulations and Raphael Sorkin's causal sets? Uh, no, this, this are not. Uh, yeah, it, this is this is completely different from what we said that, that there is not much contrast because between causal sets. Yeah, what, what, we, what we just impose as a this causality, what we call the causality condition is just this topological condition that we have fixed topology of uh, space and we divide topology into space and time and we don't let it to change. And that's, that's that, does that imply the usual causality? I mean, if you went, went to whatever some continuous approximation. I mean, uh, yeah. So the the other side, side, maybe this is true that in this way, because we, I mean, we, are some, we are somehow dividing the space and space in time, so we are somehow potentially breaking the, the global uh, invariance. However, uh, at least uh, if we look at this infrared limit and this infrared solution, it turns out that somehow this, uh, this invariance is restored in some much way. Right? And uh, yeah, it's more or less. Okay, other uh, questions? Yeah, so uh, if I understand correctly, like you also mentioned that you have some simulations about homogeneous and isotropic cosmologies. Uh, no, I mean, uh, just in our simulation, nothing is assumed to be isotropic or homogeneous. We just take, uh, I mean, we have already thousands of millions of millions of degrees of freedom of seats there. But what I just said, we are just taking one single observable. Which is partial volume. And this partial volume, which is measured in our simulations, is consistent with the assumption that uh, space time is uh, homogeneous and isotropic. Nothing more. Just this observable is consistent. It doesn't mean that we have, uh, we have these symmetries. Yeah. These symmetries are not there. But you know what's, what's, what's important that we have this path integral uh, approach. So if you just look at single uh, triangulation, single journal, you can be very far from classical. What really matters is the average, I mean, the expectation value or correction dimensions. And it seems that on this average level, really what we observe resembles uh, classical geometry with superimposed quantum equations. My question was not about the case. My question was that exactly like the way you said about the spatial volume as an observable. Mm -hmm. Can you choose an observable which can tell us what is the curvature scale at which these dimensions are changed? Is it possible? Uh, yeah, I mean, we haven't done so, but we, we can measure a lot of observables and uh, are still more uh, considering different things, and we can uh, account for this uh, homogeneity, let's say, and, and, uh, and check various, various things. And uh, yeah, it, it, it hasn't been done so. But in principle, it is possible. Um, other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank our speakers.